Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's just something that um, I've, I've sort of heard, heard more and more about. People are going towards you know unscented soaps and and not using all, all the perfume and scents and, and scented uh, lotions and things like that. What are some of those that that would um, mess with your endocrine system? Yeah, well, you know, the one that everybody's heard of is like BPA or bisphenol A, mm-hmm. but the truth is, is that a lot of, you know, anything that, um, and it's not just plastics, people think of like plastic food storage containers, but it's crazy now, manufacturers are using plastics in our clothing. Mm-hmm. Um, thermal receipt paper is really high in BPA. Um, and these things are easily absorbed through our skin. And with the receipt paper, a really interesting fact is that if you put hand sanitizer on your hands before you touch the thermal receipt paper, um, or after it increases the absorption of the BPA tenfold. And so, you know, then manufacturers pulled BPA out of products, but they're just using, you know, a different BPA They're you know, they're still using these chemicals. And, um, I had, um, uh, somebody on the podcast that, uh, that, that talked about, we had spent an entire podcast talking about this, uh, wrote a book called estrogenation and it's crazy when you look at, for instance, um, in rats, there's a specific chemical, um, that if you infuse it into these rats, hundred percent of them get endometriosis. So it might seem just like this, you know, kind of one-off thing, but these chemicals really can have a profound, uh, they can create profound problems inside of our bodies. These aren't you know, these are modern day technology that we've created. And in the book, I kind of touch on this too, that, you know, technology is amazing. The fact that you and I are sitting on this computer right now, halfway across the world, talking to each other, like this is awesome, Mm -hmm. but it all, everything comes with a trade-off, right? Everything comes with a trade-off cars are awesome, but they, you know, emit exhaust. Um, your water bottle is great because you're going to stay hydrated, but it's maybe leaching chemicals into your water. There's a trade-off for absolutely everything. It's like when I sit down to discuss risks and benefits with people, you know, we, we have to weigh both sides. And um, so for women in particular, like the cosmetic industry is so unregulated when it comes to what they can put in these products. So, you know, it's uh, in some, these days with social media, everything's coming from China and it's even less mm. regulated, but But your like your hair products, your cosmetic products that you're putting directly on your skin, like those those are really things you have to pay attention to. Your laundry detergent, you know, that you're washing your clothes in, and then the biggest one for me is like food storage. So really converting everything to like glass or stainless steel. Um, Looking at your cookware because these are things you use really often um, that really could be doing a lot of damage to your body. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's something that that completely gets overlooked. People don't think about that sort of stuff. There's, you know, some of the, some of the, maybe with the plastics, you know, maybe pla- not, not heating things in plastic containers or using plastic water bottles and things like that. But other than that, I think that's where it stops for most people if they even go that far. So definitely, yeah, yeah need to think well, about Well, when it. it comes to, when it comes to clothes, I uh, shared a study recently on men. If you put enough um, polyester near the testicles of men, you can render them infertile. Um, because it doesn't allow the, the, it doesn't allow the scrotum to, to cool down. Like the mm. reason that the testicles are away from the body is because they have to cool down, uh, to, uh, create spermatogenesis. And so I shared this study that they basically took this polyester sling and put it around the scrotum and it made hundred percent of these men infertile within a couple months. Now it was completely reversible. They were actually studying it as a male contraception. Uh, method. But I mean, this is like, this is real world stuff for me, you know, being an obstetrician, like when a couple can't get pregnant, it's like, okay, what kind of underwear is he wearing? Like, (laughs) I mean, it really could be making a difference. Yeah. A bunch of sailors are going to go out and get like polyester underwear now. (laughs) (laughs) There was, um, something my dad was telling me there was like, there was an area of like these, like, um, you know, nuclear, um, you know, battleships and, and carriers and things like that. And they had these nuclear reactors and, uh, and apparently you could go to like a certain area and, or maybe like radio. So anyway, something admitted like, you know, some low enough frequency sort of radiation and all these guys, whether it worked or not, they apparently did this. They just walked up there and just stood there for like a minute, just like radiated their, all their sperm and everything like that. Then went on shore leave. And like, they use that as like birth, temporary birth control. Birth like, control. That's, that's going to catch up to you. That's, that's, yeah. that's going to have some long-term effects. I'm sure. But, uh, um, so speaking about, um, the other pillar on, on nutrition, um, so are you counseling your, your patients? What do you normally counsel them? Is it, is it only for like a keto thing or, or what do you, what do you suggest for your patients? 
Yeah. So typically what we do when they come in is uh, we do some baseline lab work and we just say, okay, you know, where is your metabolic health at? So we look at their fasting glucose and insulin levels. We look at their fasted lipid panel, um, specifically looking like at their triglycerides and triglyceride to HDL ratio, not necessarily the LDL um, as much. If there's any, you know, uh, abnormalities, then we may get an advanced lipid panel or like an advanced cardiac panel, looking at some of their other, you know, markers, particle sizes, lipids. A lot of that is for my patients that come to me that are keto carnivore and that have some sort of question from, you know, an outside provider about what's going on. Um, and then, you know, we may look at some, you know, vitamin nutrient things it, it really just depends kind of what their initial complaint is or what, you know, their, their goals are. Um, we never want to order like tons of lab testing that we're not going to use, but I think in a basic sense, you know, we look at what's their blood pressure, you know, what's their, what's their weight or body composition. What do these fasted labs look like? And then we kind of decide, you know, what their goals are and what might be optimal for them. Um, I don't think that everybody needs to be in ketosis. I think that there are people that can eat a low carb diet and do really well. Um, you could even argue on the flip side of that, that there's some people that could probably eat high carb, low fat diets and thrive. I think that number is probably very small, mm -hmm. but, um, but we basically, you know, figure out where they are and, you know, where do we go from here? Um, when we transition people to lower carb diets, um, it's most helpful to titrate the carbs down slowly. Um, because if you go from eating 300 carbs a day to eating 30 carbs per day, um, with the quick reduction in insulin, they can get a lot of electrolyte problems in the first week or two that makes it less likely that they stick with it. Um, so, you know, we kind of go, go slow, we add electrolytes, we work on hydration and, and these other types of things. But I would say for the vast majority of patients, I do recommend what would be by today's standards considered low carb, <laughs> you know, even some of my CrossFit athletes, you know, we're doing you know, maybe a hundred or 150 or something for performance. But for, for most people, it's, it's pretty low carb. And, um, I have carnivore patients as well. Um, you know, that don't eat any plants or carbs and, uh, we, we check their labs and we look at their biomarkers and if they feel good and they're functioning good and the labs look good, then, you know, we continue with the plan. And if it's not, then we, then we change something. Oh, great. And, um, and is that, so is, and that's how you approach all these. And, and most of these would be pregnant women. So, um, this is something that, that comes up a lot, you know, is this, is even keto safe for, um, pregnancy is carnivore safe for pregnancy. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, the real answer is we don't know because, you know, we're not going to be able to do a randomized control trial in pregnancy, you know, telling these women to eat a carnivore diet and these women to eat a ketogenic diet and these people to eat a you know, vegan diet or whatever it is. And so a lot of the data that we have is very observational. Now, when we look at the recommendations for pregnancy, the lower threshold recommendation for carbohydrate consumption in pregnancy is 175 grams, um, which is probably lower than, than some people are eating. Mm -hmm. Um, but the number, uh, isn't really based in science. It is it's somewhat arbitrary in the sense that they've calculated what the kind of like obligatory use of glucose is. Uh, by the fetus and by the mom and the fact that the mom's body is growing. And then they kind of look at two standard deviations and that's how they came up with 175. I think that our goal in pregnancy is not only normal glycemia, but normal insulin levels. And let me kind of break this down a little bit. We know from data in the HAPO trials, this was the hyper uh, glycemia adverse outcome trials in pregnancy, that glucose and outcomes like NICU admission, large babies, risk of C-section, risk to your baby long-term, like your baby developing type 2 diabetes in their lifetime, is a linear relationship. It's a linear relationship. The higher the glucose levels, the higher the insulin levels, the more risk there is. Now, obviously, as a doctor, I have to pick a cutoff when we're diagnosing something like gestational diabetes to say like, okay, here's the line. You people have a problem. You people don't. But because it's a spectrum, because it's this linear relationship, there's people that get missed, right? That can still, still have problems. And so when it comes to carbohydrate consumption, it's not just normal glucose levels we want. If a woman comes to me and I have her test her blood sugars and she's eating a you know, high carbohydrate diet and her numbers look normal, the question I'm always asking myself is at the cost of what amount of insulin? Because the pancreas puts out about 30% more insulin in the first trimester of pregnancy. And it develops physiologic insulin resistance from these placental hormones in the third trimester. And the reason that this is a physiologic process is because the body is wanting to make sure that there is a continuous supply of both glucose and fatty acids that are shuttled across the placenta for the baby. 
And so, you know, really the, the placenta is what I call like team fetus. It's not, you know, if there's adverse problems for the mom too bad, we want to make sure this baby survives. Mm -hmm. And so, um, <laughs> and so what can happen is that, you know, your body will just put out more and more and more and more and more insulin, just like it does outside of pregnancy, um, to, to keep the, the glucose levels, you know, within range, but hyperinsulinemia. So even if your blood sugars look normal, hyperinsulinemia increases the risk of preeclampsia which is, you know, a very, uh, dangerous disorder for pregnant women to get. And we're getting, we're seeing it on the rise gestational hypertension of pregnancy. Um, it still increases the risk for large babies, risk of shoulders, so uh, C-sections and, and a lot of risks for your baby long-term because hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia create epigenetic modifications, meaning they actually alter your baby's DNA, turning this, you know, certain genes off and on. And these are inheritable conditions. So basically you know, you're altering your, uh, your family for, for decades and centuries to come, you're altering the DNA. Um, so diet and pregnancy is very important, you know, to say that 175 and no less than that is the recommendation could be causing harm. And in medicine, right. We say do no harm. I think there are patients, you know, I've had gestational diabetic patients that certainly have to eat way less than that to control their blood sugars. And I have patients that come into pregnancies have been, you know, very healthy, doing well on low carb diets, you know, prior to pregnancy. And they ask, can I continue? And when we look at the Institute of Medicine recommendations, they admit in the Institute you know, of Medicine recommendations that if you are eating adequate dietary fat and protein, carbohydrates are non-essential really for life and for pregnancy. Now, does that mean that women should be zero carb? I don't know that that's the answer. Um, you know, I think that we have to be careful about, you know, metabolic stress and physiologic stress in the pregnancy. Um, but I think that there are people that do really well in pregnancy on low carb diets. And, um, you know, I wish we could see more of this published data, um, but it's really observational at this point. I mean, that's just the, the, the real answer. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's at least interesting, at least they're saying that, you know, that, um, you know, that you don't necessarily need it. And that's, um, you know, it's kind of, it's, uh, yeah, interesting they said that, you know, it's, it's, it was also, um, I found it interesting. You're talking about the epigenetics and how this can have downstream effects and be inheritable. I, I just randomly recently saw a uh, video on some, uh, research done, I think it was like in the twenties and thirties, it was called Pottinger's cats. And this guy was doing research on cats and like actually exploring TB and he wanted to like take out their adrenals. They thought there was you know, people that had like adrenal issues were more susceptible to tuberculosis. So he's doing this in cats. And he found that the cats that they were feeding like cooked meat to just, just meat, um, weren't really surviving these surgeries, uh, these adrenalectomies. And, but the ones that were having, uh, just raw meat were doing fine and they were doing very well and they were healthier in other metrics. So we actually switched the course of his entire research and just started studying, um, the, the effect of these nutri you know, nutrition on these cats and just had cats just eating cooked meat and just eating raw meat. And they found that the ones eating cooked meat were not health healthier for a lot of different reasons, but then the next generation, they were physically structurally different. They were generally smaller in stature, their brains and their, their, um, psychomatic arch weren't completely formed. And, uh, and the bone mineral density or bone mineral, um, percentage was, was actually much lower as a like half of what they would normally see. And then in the third generation, it was even worse. And I think they had only had like 3% uh, bone mineralization in the third generation of the just cooked meat. It was still meat, it was just cooked meat. And um, and, they, and the bones were like almost spongy, like foam rubber, rubber, and they had all these fractures and breaks. And, and at, at, after that point, they were sterile. Um, and they, they couldn't, uh, they either couldn't procreate or, the, or they had stillbirth. And um, they said that they could reverse that by putting them back onto a, a raw meat diet, but they found it took four generations to, to mm. get them back to where just the, the raw food, um, cats were at this, at, you know, at the beginning. So I thought that was very, yeah. very interesting. And it just sort of demonstrates the effects of, of these knock-on effects that, that you were describing. Yeah. I think it's fascinating. I mean, I think our bodies are, uh, they're a, a brilliant species. They're always trying to adapt you know, to our environment and our stressors and things like that. But, um, there there's real world ramifications of these things for, mm -hmm. for generations to come. I mean, it's not just like, oh, grandma had diabetes and you know, that was her story. It's, I mean, <laughs> your, your DNA is, but the, but the other caveat with that, that I want to say is that, um, we are finding that epigenetic modifications probably matter more than 
your, your DNA written code. So the good news is that you, you have a lot of power, you know, the person listening right now, like just because your mom smoked and drank and ate Cheetos her whole pregnancy, like doesn't mean you're doomed. Um, you yourself have, you know, the power to turn these switches off and on and, um, and, and that will matter for your, for your children. So you're not just doomed, but, uh, they do have a profound impact on, on your health. Yeah, absolutely. 